Shalom, everyone. Welcome back. Parsha Insights, Parsha Shlach. I have to begin with an apology. Um, as I've mentioned in, in weeks past, the, uh, the source sheets are a work in progress. And the source sheet that was sent out this morning was indicative of where my head was when I prepared it last night. However, it has very little relationship to the source sheet that I'm going to share with you right now because my, my, my mind worked in, in different directions today. And I said, you know what? I can't pass up the opportunity to look at what I think is one of the most fascinating Midrashic incidents in our tradition. And oftentimes with Midrash, you know, you start with the beginning of the Parsha and you get stuck because there's so much juice there. But I wanted to take a step back. We're going to go to the end of the Parsha. We're going to go to the middle of the Parsha and maybe go back to the beginning at the very end, if uh, if time if time permits, so I, I I do have to begin with for those who uh, who did your homework. Not that there's homework. Not that there's any expectation. It's a bonus if people would like to uh, would like to look at the sources beforehand. I do have to apologize. Um, I would say it's not my fault, but it is my fault, and I'm sorry for that. Okay, but we're going to jump right in to looking at the at the revised source sheet, um, which begins. Let me find it. Here we go. Okay, so we're going to jump right into the middle of the story. So what has happened until now? You know what? I'm going to stop sharing for a moment so we can talk outside. We can share a little bit about what has happened. It's a very uh, simple story, but with you know, if you dig just a little bit beneath the surface, you'll encounter some significant complexity. So the story is Moses sends spies, and so God tells Moses to send spies, quote, I'm quote, using the quotes uh, in quotation marks, because this is a word, you know, the word spies has its own connotation in, in, in English, and, and certainly, uh, you know, the, the idea of the spies from Hollywood and Soviet spies and so on and so forth is not what's meant and what, not what, what was in the mind of, uh, of, of the Torah as it's presenting these uh, people to us. They're called miraglim. It comes from the Hebrew word regel. So Hebrew regel means a, a leg or a foot. So these are foot travelers. These are wanderers. Send people to walk through the land. And the Hebrew word, and this is the Hebrew word that you'll remember for the rest of your life because it's the same as the English word, latur. The Hebrew word tour means to tour. I don't know the etymology, but T-O-U-R and taf vav resh are the same, uh, are, are, are the same word basically. So send these miraglim, send these spies to wander into the land of, in the land of Israel. There's a lot of, of many fascinating things that are happening. Moses tells them, go and see if the people are, are strong or if they're weak. See if the cities are fortified or if they're not. Look at the produce. Look at all this. And the people come back, of course, with a negative report. Ten of the twelve come back with a negative report. The two that don't are Yehoshua and Kalev. Kalev is the only one who, of those who are, and Yehoshua and Kalev are the only two, basically, who get to go into the land of Israel. The rest of the people are condemned not to go in. This is a day of great tragedy. Um, the report came back negative. People started to cry and they part, started to be despondent. And there comes 40 years of wandering in, in, in the wilderness. And the question, um, the question, the big question is, you know, okay, they, they sinned and they were punished. But what was the sin exactly? Reading the story, it's not very clear. It doesn't, there's no mitzvah that they transgress. There's no, no prohibition that they actually violated. And, and that's part of the mystery. That's part of what the commentators do. That's part of what the midrashim do is, is say, what exactly went, went wrong here? We might look at a midrash. That'll be the very end of the sources that, that offers an approach uh, in, that, uh, in, in that direction. But that's basically where we stand. In the story, we're going to jump right into the middle where God is punishing the, the people, where God is telling the people, uh, you have sinned and therefore you are going to be punished. So here we go. Vayomer Adonai Salachti Kidvarecha. God says, I forgive you. I'm not going to destroy you. I'm not going to murder you. I'm not going to kill you. Death will not result more than it has because of this particular sin. However, nevertheless, verse 21, as I live and as God's presence fills the whole world, none of those involved, 
all of the people who saw all of the great things that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and they tested me, right? God, I am the one who tests Abraham. You are not the ones who test me. You have tested me time and time again and disobeyed me. They, they will not see the land that I promised their ancestors. Those who spurn me, none of those who spurn me will, will see it. So that's the punishment right there. It's a pretty drastic punishment, but it's not death. But basically, you know, this is happening at the beginning of the second year of the wandering. They have made their way from Egypt to Mount Sinai. And now they're close to the land. They're just a few days journey away from the land, as we read in last week's parasha. They're just a few days journey away from the land. They're at the border. They have to be at the border. They send spies into the land. How could they not be at the border? And God said, they sin. And God says, ah, you know that, that border you were about to, uh, to, to enter into? You're not going to get there right away. This is worse than Canadian airports right now. You're not going to be able to enter right away. You're going to have to wait, and not just a few hours, and not just a few days, but you're going to wait until the end of 40 years when the entire generation who witnessed the miracles has passed, all the adults have passed, and now... Then they're going to go into the land of Israel at the end of 40 years. Right? So that's, that's the punishment. It's a fairly, fairly drastic, fairly significant uh, punishment. Okay, any, any questions? Then we're going to look at, uh, at, at a, a section of Maimonides and relate it back to this, uh, to this punishment. Any, any questions? Yeah, what yeah. it seems to see, it seems to give an out to those people that did not try God, but you know, you know, not not so that they're gonna get to see it's not everybody that's gonna die out. If you look at the text, I don't understand. Say that. Say that again. That explain those people. Yeah. That that tested God, they don't get to see. But those yeah, that yeah, did it, not, yeah. It seems it indicates so it's from the not verse, all. It's, it's only those people generation. who tested, but it will be a collective punishment, as we'll see. They're going to, you know, God's not going to single out these people can go and those people can't. The exception, the explicit exception is made for Yehoshua, who will lead the people into the land, and Kalev. Kalev ben Yefuna, who was the other spy who brought back the positive report and said, Ale, na ale, we, yes, we can go in. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll get to go into the land. Elaine asked the question, uh, God did tell the people he was giving them land, but in the end they didn't believe him. Was that their sin? So, uh, yeah, excellent. That, that's part of it is that they, they just didn't take the word of God at face value. They should have just marched in with great faith, with their eyes, you know, closed to all the dangers around them and gone in and said, God promised us, so God's going to give it to us. And they didn't do that. And that's what um, we're going to see uh, at the end. That's what one of the Midrashim alludes to, that actually the sin was the entire, this entire episode of the spies. They should have never needed spies to begin with. God told them they're going to get the land. What do you need spies for? What do you need to see if the land is good or not? God said the land's good. But, what, you know, Moses is saying, go send the spies in to see if, if the people there are strong or if they're weak. What does it matter? Who cares? You're stronger than they are. God's with you. So no matter how strong they are, they're not going to be, they're not going to be a match be a match for you. One uh, interesting teaching, this is uh, in, uh, just a parenthetical teaching, is that there's a fascinating cross-communication or mix mix up in communication that takes place between Moses and the people. Moshe says, go and see them and see if they're strong, if they're weak, if they live in fortified cities or not. That's what Moses says. The people come back and say, oh my gosh, their cities are fortified. They're so strong. So what was wrong there? So what Moses asked them, see if they're strong and if they're weak or if they're weak or if they're fortified in fortified cities or not. And as Rashi notes there, there's a Midrash. I didn't bring this in the sources, I don't think. But there's a Midrash that said, maybe I did an earlier version. The Midrash says, what does Moses say? Go see if they're strong. And if they're strong, what kind of cities are they going to be in? Fortified or unfortified? They're going to be in unfortified cities. Go and see if they're weak. And if they're weak, what kind of cities are they going to need? They're going to need fortified. The stronger the protection, the weaker the position. That's the, that, that's the principle that Moses is dealing with. If you go in 
and you see walls all around and you see barriers, then you know that they are vulnerable. If you see a people who's living without, without walls, without anything, be wary of those people. They're, they're, they're tough people. That's, the, that's what Moses says. The people come back and they say, oh, they have fortified cities. They're so strong. The people didn't know the difference. There was an interesting cross-communication there that, that didn't work. But that's a, that's a, parenthetical, uh, a parenthetical comment that relates to everything, including how we secure ourselves and how we think about our own protection and what it says about, about us and about who we are in our own position. And of course, the dream and I you know, say this from the perspective of a, a Jewish community of a synagogue, the dream for all of us is that our security budget be zero. Yeah. The, 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 the messianic dream is that whatever protections we put in place for us are entirely unnecessary, are what one sees in synagogues in, in Europe of security presence and police and buildings that are built really to keep threats out more than they are to keep doors open. Uh, to, to, to people who are coming to worship, that's, the, that, that's not an ideal situation. That's a reflection of the reality of being, being vulnerable in a world that, that has many threats against us. So that's just uh, a parenthetical note about, this, uh, about the sin of the spy. So the punishment- Rabbi, can, I, yeah. can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. It says, Salah fi kibarecha. Don't we say that at Yom Kippur? Great, yeah. Yeah. that is part of, uh, part of Slichot. Part of the Slichot, okay. including on Yom Kippur. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So let's, uh, let's go back to our sources. Maimonides, and this needs a little bit of context. This is uh, uh, 332. This is a famous section of Maimonides, the guide 332. Um, and, and Maimonides here is dealing with the concept of, of sacrifices. And, and, and Maimonides has a very famous uh, position of sacrifices where Maimonides and Nachmanides disagree. And why, Maimonides said, why do we need sacrifices according to Maimonides? Maimonides says we need sacrifices because the people were people who sacrificed. Because in the wilderness, they gave sacrifices. They, that was their, their way of religion. And so we needed to offer sacrifices. The Torah needed to bring sacrifices because that was familiar. Because you can't expect people to change their paradigms overnight. If, if God had come along and said, I have a new religion and there are no sacrifices, the people would have said, well, that doesn't look like religion to me. And, and, and the relevant question and where, where we're going to talk about this in, in a, a practical way is when we pray, you know, we pray many different times in many different ways. God, please restore the holy temple. Restore your service to the way that it was. So when we say those prayers, we say it every time we say the Amidah, I mean, many different times. What do we mean when we say those prayers? Do we mean that God, please set up the altars, let us schlep those cattle and the oxen and the goats up to the holy temple, let the Kohanim, let the holy temple become a slaughterhouse once again for the animal sacrifices? Is that what we mean? So the question is going to be answered based on on uh, your determination as to the nature of sacrifices. Are sacrifices an ideal religious concept? Yes, God desires animal sacrifice, period. Or, as Maimonides said, it was a reflection of the needs of the ancient Israelites who were people who sacrificed, who sacrificed animals. But absent that, it's not an ideal, it's a concession. And it's an acknowledgement that people have difficulty changing. And maybe in the 3,000 years since the Torah has been given to us, then maybe our needs have changed. And maybe sacrifices will not be a part of a renewed holy temple. But you understand the, the, the issue is... So why that, then So then, why don't we say when and we're doing uh, the tefillot, not lo, not a seven, not kriv, but why don't we do put it in the past, asu vihi krivu? We didn't change our text if you look at the Yeah, because, because those texts were not written according to the approach of Maimonides. But if, if we were pure Maimonide, Maimonidean Jews, which we are not, then we would, exactly, we would rephrase those texts and say, may we worship once again in the Holy Temple with words and with prayer. That's what we would say, because that's our form of, 
of religion now of, of religious expression nowadays and we would say you know the, the sacrifices animal sacrifices are a thing of the past no way not for me right I, if we were true Maimonidean Jews okay so um so Maimonides in 332 says many of the precepts in our law result of a similar course adopted by the same supreme being it namely it's impossible to go suddenly from one extreme to the other okay that's Again, Maimonides, Aristotle, Metron, Ariston, the golden path, the golden mean. We are trying to trace a path right in the middle. It's therefore, according to the nature of man, impossible for him suddenly to discontinue everything to which he has been accustomed. And Maimonides says that's why they offered animal sacrifice. And then he says, you know what? There's another example of this. What's that? That God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war, they return to Egypt. He said, here God led the people about, away from the direct. Why? Not because they were going to be afraid of the enemies, because he may, might, uh, he feared they might meet on the way with hardships that were too great. He took them by another road in order that he obtained the original objective, because it's contrary to man's nature that he should suddenly abandon all the different kinds of divine service and different customs he had been brought up. And with general, it would be as if a person trained to work as a slave with mortar and bricks or similar things should interrupt his work, clean his hands, and at once fight with real giants. It's impossible to go from one paradigm to another so abruptly. And it was as the result of God's wisdom that the Israelites were led about in the wilderness till they acquired courage. For it's a well-known fact that traveling in the wilderness and privation of the bodily enjoyment, such as bathing, produce courage, while the reverse is a source of faint-heartedness besides Another generation rose during the wanderings that had not been accustomed to degradation and slavery. So the generation that entered the land of Israel was a new generation. They didn't have the old customs. They didn't have the old weaknesses. And they were able to go into the land of Israel and live new lives and celebrate new things and live according to the objectives and the ideals of the Torah. Rabbi Sachs, in one of his essays, points to this section of Maimonides and says, wait a second, Maimonides is saying something very profound here, not by what he is saying, but by his omission. What is he leaving out? Maimonides says, you know why the children of Israel wandered in the desert for 40 years? So that a new generation could arise because the old generation didn't have it in them to enter the land and to make all of those abrupt changes and live go from being a slave people to suddenly being a strong people who can settle the land, who can, who can be present and build and all of that. What's Maimonides leaving out? He's leaving out the punishment. Why did the children of Israel wander in the wilderness for 40 years? According to Maimonides, this is part of God's wise design. According to the Torah, because they were punished, because they sent spies into the land and they came back with a bad report, and therefore they're punished. You shall not see the land. Maimonides ignores that. It's a, it's an amazing, it's a, it's a radical approach that Rabbi Jonathan Sachs points out. This is not my point. This is Rabbi said is a point of a, of a sage, much much greater, much wiser than 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 I will ever be. And he says, very very beautifully and profound that Maimonides is making a proof by rejecting the Torah's own admission of you will wander for 40 years because you are being punished and framing it in a positive this is the divine plan you need to wander because you need the time to grow and because you need a new generation that's gonna that's going to to arise this is a very profound statement by Maimonides about about what people need in terms of, of changing about the laws of it applies to the laws of sacrifice but it applies to so much else in our lives, in our lives as well. So I wanted to put that out there as a, a, a what I think is a very interesting a exchange second. between the Torah and the Guide to the Perplex and Maimonides' Guide to the Perplex. On the other hand, as to what were they doing for those extra thirty-nine years? Why didn't they just go into the land of Israel? The Torah, because they were punished, because they deserved to. to they want. They should have gone into the land, but by their own fault, they didn't enter the land. The land and Rambam, because it wouldn't have worked. You take this people right out of Egypt and throw them into the land of Israel, that's too abrupt a change. That, 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 won't, that won't take. You need the time. You need the new generation to achieve the objectives 
that were that were set out. Yeah, Monica. Where does the idea of punishment come? Is it mentioned or alluded to at all in the Torah? Uh, or is the, this the, just in the interpretation? No, the, the punishment is, is explicit in the Torah. Because you have sinned against me, because okay. you have tested me so, and tried me, you will not okay. enter the land. So then, but Maimonides, in skipping over that, why doesn't he at least address well, he, why is that mentioned? Why, he's not, he's not why skipping does the Torah... You, you know, he, he does speak to that in other places. He does mention those verses in other places, but he oh. is not prioritizing it. He's saying maybe that's a reason, but that's not the reason. I see, but he does come back to it somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, he's not omitting it from the Torah. He's not excising okay. it from the Torah, but he is saying that the primary reason is actually a reason that has much more to do with, with general human nature than has to do with the specific sin of, uh, of, of, the, uh, uh, of the generation of the spies. Okay, we are now going to look, and I want to just be mindful of time because we have uh, a story which I think is a pretty dramatic and radical story, um, which I'd love to hear your, your takes on uh, as well. So let's jump back. And we are uh, headed to the end of the parasha. The end of the parasha, God says the mitzvah of tzitzit. It's the mitzvah of the four cornered, uh, of the four -cornered garment. So uh, God says to Moses saying, Daber el b'nei Yisrael, speak to the children of Israel, ve'amarta alehem, and instruct them to make for themselves fringes on the corners of their garments throughout the ages, l'dorotam, for all generations and let them attach a cord of blue to the fringe at each corner, right? So has, has everyone seen the fringes, the blue fringes is something that's come into uh, more popular, um, you know what? I'm gonna pause for six seconds and going to get a, uh, a sample of, of the fringes. So hold on just a second. It's on the other side of the room. It's a very small room that I'm in. So give me a moment and I'll, I'll do a little show and tell. Okay, so we have here, these are, this is a talus, and the fringes you see are blue. There's a blue string that's mixed in with the white strings on, on the tzitzit. This is tied in a very unique way. This is according, actually according to Maimonides' uh, tradition of how to tie the string, and it's done uniquely when there is a blue string. This is the style of, uh, of, of tying it. It's a very... Anyway, very intricate, uh, intricate way, but there is, see how many blue strings there are? I don't know if you can see. And the answer is actually that it's a half of a blue string because the tzitzit have eight fringes, but they really are four strings that are bent over in the middle. So a half of a string is colored with the blue dye and the rest are, the rest are white for a variety of reasons. So this is your, these, these are your, uh, this is your tchelet as was biblically ordained. Now, they did not have trelet for many, many years. There was a, a, a Rebbe in, in, in Poland, um, a Hasidic Rebbe, the Rezhner Rebbe, who believed that he had discovered the original dye for the trelet. For many centuries, they lost the tradition. They don't know what the dye is. We know it comes from the Chila zone, which is a type of animal, perhaps a type of snail, we're not sure. And there were many opinions as to what it was. It was lost in the tradition. They restored it, they, they discovered it, and then you have questions about is something that was completely lost, can it be rediscovered at all? Is that, or once we break from the tradition, is the tradition lost, lost forever? Do we need an uninterrupted tradition or not? And then more in modern times in Israel, they've discovered a snail and up in near Haifa, and, and, and they've been able to, to, to farm the snail, and they've been able to generate the dye and been able to create this market for, uh, for trelet, which has really taken off. When I first wore trelet on my tzitzit um, about uh, 25, 25 years ago. It was a novel thing, and it was a, a, a major investment, and you had to go to the specialist in, in Jerusalem, who's the only one who can do it. Now you can buy it anywhere. You can go online to, I'm sure, I'm sure there are lots of places to get to, to, to get trelet. It's become very, very popular. So the verse says uh, that you should get the trelet, the blue dye, that shall be your fringe. Look at it and recall all of the commandments. Uh, is recall all of the commandments of God and observe them, so that you do not follow your heart and eyes and your lustful urge. Thus, you shall be reminded to observe all my commandments and to be holy to God. I am your God, who brought you out of Egypt. 
in the land of Egypt to be your God, I, your God. Okay, so that's the mitzvah of tzitzit. And in the Hebrew, I have uh, emphasized, I've bolded this phrase, ani Hashem elokechem, because it appears twice in the same verse, the beginning of the verse and the end of the verse. And what the Midrash is going to do, what the Talmud is going to do, is going to be to try to interpret why does it repeat this phrase, this phrase twice, and it's going to do it in the most fascinating way. So we'll take a look in the uh, English translation. It was taught, Rav Natan said, this is a shocking story. If you've heard this already, you'll, your surprise will be suppressed, but if not, this is a jarring, shocking story in the Babylonian Talmud. There's not a single precept in the Torah, even the lightest, whose reward is not enjoyed in this world. And as to its reward in the future world, I know not how great it is. Go and learn. So he's referring to the mitzvah of tzitzit as just an example of there's reward. You might think that this is an insignificant mitzvah, but actually there's great reward for this. It's actually quite, quite uh, remarkable. Once there was a man who was very scrupulous about the precept of tzitzit. And he heard of a certain harlot in one of the towns by the sea who accepted 400 gold dinars for her hire. You may be able to see where this is going even before we start. So this is a man of, of, of complexity. Well, the one thing we know we're setting out in the story, this is a man who is very religious but has significant weaknesses, let's say, or has uh, vulnerabilities in his own, in his desire. And he hears of a harlot, of a prostitute, who is the fanciest, who is the most expensive in the entire land. He sent her 400 gold dinars and appointed a day with her. You want to know how exclusive a harlot she was? You had to prepay. You had to send 400 gold dinars to her in advance and appoint and make an appointment with her she, in demand. <laughs> when the day arrived, came, waited at her door, her maid came, her maid came and told her, the man who sent you 400 gold dinars is here waiting at the door, to which she replied, let him come in. Okay, we're, we're, we're building up the tension in the story. Not only is she an expensive harlot, she has a staff waiting on her. She has a waiting room. She's got an official operation. She has a, uh, okay, anyway. So when he came in, she prepared for him seven beds, six of silver, one of gold. And between one bed and the other, there was not a pea, but there were steps of silver. And but the last of and were, uh, but the last were of gold. She then went up to the top bed and lie, lie down on it, upon it naked. He too went up after her in his desire to sit naked with her. When all of the sudden, the four fringes of his garments struck him across the face. Whereupon he slipped off and sat upon the ground. So uh, as, 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 one, as one does, uh, his, his tzitzit remained on uh, because he was very meticulous about this particular mitzvah. And his tzitzit slapped him across the face. I, I, you know, I, at a certain point, I can't elaborate any more than the text offers, offers to us. And he falls down onto the ground, having been slapped in the face. And uh, she also slipped off and sat on the ground. So presumably, purposefully, she... Then she, you know, this has never happened to her before. She's she's the most desired harlot in the land. Why did he why did he descend? Why did he not go up and and, and lie with her? What, what what happened? She's shocked. She said, "By the Roman capital, I will not leave you alone until you tell me what blemish you saw in me. Why did you go down? Why did you descend?" And he said, "By the temple, never have I seen a woman as beautiful as you are." He says, "He's good with words." <laughs> He's very complimentary. But there is one precept which the Lord our God commanded us. It's called tzitzit. And with regard to it, the expression, I am the Lord your God, is written twice as we saw, signifying I am he who will exact punishment in the future, and I am he who will give reward in the future. And now that tzitzit appeared to me as four witnesses testifying against me about what I was about to do. She said, I will not leave you until you tell me your name, the name of your town, the name of your teacher, the name of your school in which you study the Torah. And he wrote all of this down and handed it and handed it to her. 
Thereupon she arose, divided her estate into three parts, one third for the government, one third to be distributed amongst the poor, one third she took with her for herself. The bedclothes she retained, the fancy, fancy bedclothes that only a harlot of high repute has. And then she came to the Beit Midrash of Rebbe Chia, who was the Rebbe of this particular man. And she said to him, Master, give instructions about me that they may make me a proselyte so that I may convert to your faith, she says. He replies, my daughter, perhaps you have set your eyes on one of the disciples. Maybe the reason you want to convert is because you're in love with one of the students. And therefore, should I, should I suspect your intentions? Do you, are you doing this for love or are you doing this out of a, a love for Judaism or the love of a man? She thereupon uh, took out the script and handed it to him. She was upfront. She was honest. She handed it to him. And he saw the name of the disciple. He said, go and enjoy your acquisition, he says to her. Go, meaning converted her, and says, go and enjoy your husband. And those very bedclothes, which she had spread for him for an illicit purpose, she now spread out for him lawfully, because they were married. This is the reward of the precept in this world. So we're going back to the beginning of the phrase, Rav Natan says, the reward, there's reward for everything in this world, and the reward in the future, I don't know. And he said, this is the reward for the precept in this world. What's the reward? He gets to marry the most beautiful, the most beautiful woman in the land, the most beautiful harlot, 400 dinar. He gets, he, she's now his wife. And as for its reward in the future world, I know not how great, how great it is. The olam haba, eni yodea kama. I don't know how much the, the reward in the future world is. And that's your story about tzitzit. That's the Talmud's treatment of the mitzvah of tzitzit and anecdote. So tell me, dear friends, what messages of interest, of depth, do you see in this particular story of the man going to the harlot, tzitzit, slap him in the face, and ultimately they get married, she converts, they get married, and all live happily ever after. Any thoughts or comments? I see a lot of thoughts, but I don't hear any comments. <laughs> it's, it's a very, yeah. yeah but, I have a thought. Yeah, please. I have a thought. The only thing that I it comes to me is that in the end, he listened to the tzitzit. He did not follow his heart and his eyes. They hit him in the face, but he could have just said, oh, you know, and just gone into bed with her. He complied. He complied to what? The, the tzitzit are, are, are inanimate. They're inanimate, but they are there to remind you not to follow your heart and your eyes. Hmm. Hmm. And they, they he, didn't remind him of anything. And he had the nerve to get into bed with a prostitute wearing his tzitzit. How gross is that? No, no, no. But he didn't actually get in the last minute that tzitzit prevailed. He listened. So this is to, the question. The tzitzit in the last. Is this man a, a holy man or a sinner or somewhere in between? Well, a real sinner is somebody who really jumps in bed and goes all there. And you know, he, there, there is a, a phenomenon, I hesitate to bring this up. There was a uh, phenomenon that was uh, discussed many, many years ago in, in the modern Orthodox or the Orthodox community. Um, yeah. And I'll, I'll, uh, they're called tefillin dates. A tefillin date. And that referred to a religious person who sins. What's a tefillin date? You'll understand as soon as I say. It's uh, when it's, you go to the date holding with your tefillin in hand because one anticipates staying over until the next morning where you need to put tefillin on. That's a tefillin date. So what does one make of this? Right? Wow. What does one make of, of that combination of, of religious fervor on the one hand and a willingness and an eagerness to sin and to, to put oneself in a position of... Uh, of sin, of, of transgression. What does one make of a person who, who, who goes to see the harlot? And, you know, the, the, the tzitzis don't save the day. 
the man's not removing his tzitzis, his own tzitzis, his, his, his hesitation, his connection to that mitzvah are what saves the day. The tzitzis themselves do nothing. I don't know. The, uh, the whole concept of tefillin dates, which I'm aware of, discuss the entire community. And it indicates how low Jewish boys have fallen. Yeah. Yeah. Look, there, there, are, there are two sides of it, right? How low, how low people have fallen, maybe. But there's another side that says, you know, people are bringing their religion into places that they wouldn't bring it before. And that religion had no place before. It was all or nothing. And then suddenly there's a phenomenon in which people are living lives that, that have sin in the traditional sense at the, at the core of, of their behavior patterns. But at the same time, there are deep connections to these particular can I, can I disagree. What it indicates, what it indicates is how how poorly young Jewish girls are being treated by Jewish boys in this world. And it also indicates how, how low the girls' self-esteem is and how desperate they are because Jewish boys have such a problem committing themselves that they lower themselves to be to be to be you know to be misused. It, it, it's the opposite of women's lib. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I think that this may be worthy of a, of a broader conversation of, uh, of, of the dynamics that are existing within these, uh, within these concepts. But I would say at least this concept, this is an ancient example of this, of, of a man who, uh, you know, the symbolism of his, of his fall from grace, his fall from the seventh, seventh mattress is, is, is you know, quite, quite telling, slapped in the face by the tzitzit. And that's also very similar to the, you know, the rituals that we have. We actually bring our tzitzit to our face. We bring our tzitzit, part of the custom is to kiss the tzitzit, is to actually bring it to the face. So this man was engaged in that custom in some way, or the tzitzit and the face met, but in a much more violent sense of, of waking up. And, and I think this is a very relevant and relatable story, not in its details of, of you know, somebody going to a harlot with their tzitzis on, but of the intersection between sin and mitzvah. The wearing our Judaism on our sleeves, but at the same time, the willingness to go and do things that are very un-Jewish, such as this man. I'm not talking about paying more than retail that he did, his 400 dinar. That's not the un-Jewish thing. The un-Jewish thing is going going to the harlot, um, I think is quite a, uh, quite a, a dramatic move. And Thankfully, that sits us one out, right? right. This story, thankfully, the story ends well. We have another Jew who's a member of our community, and she has a new, a fresh beginning, and they're married, and what they were about to do illicitly became now a lawful marriage, and that's beautiful and wonderful and exciting. But on the other hand, think of all the times it doesn't go well, and all the other times where, where the tzitzis are removed. So there's something very sacred. And before about that, she's a harlot. That's ridiculous. What, why is that ridiculous? Why did why before that is she a harlot? What if maybe she's just a nice girl who's going to marry a nice man? Uh, well, in this particular uh, Talmudic story, it's, a, she's a it, harlot. it's explicit in this story that she is a harlot. That's her yeah, profession. Because? Yeah, that's and her profession. She goes and marries this guy after she experiences his re moment of, of religious awakening. What was his, but not hers. That was her. Maybe yes, maybe that was hers too, when she saw how somebody could be so attached to their beliefs that they don't have to go all the way. The question also is, at what point is the crime committed? Mm. Is it in the thinking of it, or is it in the doing of it? Yeah. He does not actually... Does he act, I'll ask you all, does he actually commit a crime? Hmm. Or is he thinking? Yeah, he, he got, no, a, he, yeah, he, he arrived at the, he arrived at the place, he got yeah. undressed and got into bed. No, I mean, no, really, no, I mean, no. really. So you're going to wait until the exact point of, of intercourse or otherwise he's a real he, good he, he committed, no. he committed, technically he committed yeah. many sins. He Maybe. may not have committed. Okay. The I mean, like sin, intention. but he committed many sins along the way. There were many things that he did wrong. And I think when reading a story like yeah. this, we can choose choose our focus. 
and right. and I think the Talmud is asking us, or at least teasing us in a sense, and asking us, you know, when when when, when talking about the good and talking about goodwill and, and talking about uh, uh, evaluating a particular act, you evaluate it based on the result, you evaluate it based on the intentions, you evaluate it based on what's happened along the way, and 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 kind of add up a, a system of merits and demerits. Because if you evaluate it at the end, by the end product, this is a good thing. This is a mitzvah story. We have a, a convert to Judaism who is married to a good Jewish boy. We have a Jewish boy who will never sin in this way again because he now has a way to, to kind of sublimate his urges because now he's married to the harlot and, and, and she's no longer a harlot. Now she's a, now she's a, a, a kosher Yiddish vibe, a kosher Jewish wife. And, and, and that's there's, there's something to that. That's the end of the story. Um, I think it shows yeah. the frailty of the human that uh, things are not always black and white and mm -hmm. that everybody is capable of making mistakes, I, but they're also capable of rectifying those good. mistakes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. There is something to that. And there's also the urging us to put ourselves in a position to be talked into doing good. And that's part of what the tzitzit are as a reminder. Why do I need a reminder? Well, because we all need reminders throughout the day. We all so need reminders at every moment of our life that we are that we are Jewish, that we have a set of values, because absent these reminders, we're likely to slip and fall even more than we do than we do naturally. Yes, and women? Women should be wearing CCs too then. Great question. I'm so happy you, you asked that question because <laughs> when it comes to reminders. Um, the, the two paradigms for, for reminders in our tradition are male-oriented reminders. One is the tzitzit, and the other is the kippah. If you want, yeah, you know, yeah. if, right. if you ask me to articulate the value of wearing a kippah, what I would go to, you know, identifying as a Jew, that would be secondary. You know, wearing it together with my co-religionist, that would be kind of the third, uh, the third reason. The first reason for me would be because it's a constant reminder of my responsibilities to God and to myself and to my own set of values. And obviously, if I'm walking around town wearing a kippah, if I had the urge to shoplift or what, or even jaywalk or anything like that, any, you'll always think twice, three times, four times, five times when I'm wearing a kippah. And so the natural question is, yeah, but what about the other half of the population? for which Jewish custom doesn't have tzitzit or, or And a if a woman, and let's say women say, let's say we women all decided, well, if the men can wear kippahs and have that, that aura and protectionism or whatever, and religiosity, then, uh, then women should be wearing kippahs too. But then they say, ah, oh, transgender, and they'll get into all of that. So yeah. you can't so do that. It's an excellent- so, so women should do it, maybe maybe to be equal with men but, but yeah look it would, I, I, it would have I, a connotation to it i think uh you know the, the transgender conversation i think we're, we're far away from that i think we're, we're miles and miles away from that the idea of a kippa uh for a women is is certainly worth uh worth discussing and exploring yeah it, it's nothing i'm i'm specifically opposed to it simply is not reflective of our customs as a community and what we're dealing with Never. right now and trying to to figure Never. out is is you know why do we only have half of the population that has these particular uh these particular customs and this story you know unless you want to tell me that women are not tempted to sin in the same way that that men are as as some might argue but but certainly would not be a uh, an acceptable argument to me or a prevalent argument um, and are you saying, sorry for interrupting you, but are you saying that because men are wearing kippas and, and tzitzis, are, are you saying that that makes them holier than women? No, no. not at You're all. The, okay. I, I'm simply You're saying that, the, not that the, the, no, I would never, never say that. I, okay. I'm simply <laughs> saying that men have an extra, that a kippa, not men, a kippa provides an extra reminder for those who wear it not to sin. That's it. And uh, and, and the question from, from that would be, okay, so why don't everybody have, a, everybody have a kippah? And also, I just want to reiterate that it's not foolproof, that a kippah does not, is not protection from sin. 
if if that were the case, then the Jewish community would look very differently than our scandals in our community, which we don't bury and we don't shy away from, but we confront. They wouldn't exist. We we have major. We all know the the issues that we have in our in our community. I remember Rabbi David Hartman used to say, uh, you know, used to have a line along the lines of, um, you know, well, being religious didn't make him any worse. You know, that was his when people would point to somebody who goes to shul and say, I. How could they go to shul when they're having an affair? With that? How could they stay, stand in daven when they're such terrible people? He said, well, imagine what it would be like if you weren't religious. You know, maybe being religious didn't make them any worse. But uh, you know, I'm not even sure about that because some people hide behind religion to perpetuate their own misdeeds also. That's there right. is a pure yes. expression of yes. religious life. And, uh, and, and we know yes. examples of where that's not the case. Um, yes. Yeah. I, we're, we're running over time, which I kind of anticipated uh, with this story because it is a, a very juicy story. There's a lot. There's a lot there, but it's a yeah. fascinating example. You know, talking about bringing us back home to the idea of midrash and what this what this does is the, there is a textual issue. issue. The te the issue in the text is that it says, "I am the Lord your God" twice. That's it, and we have to explain why a phrase is repeated. And so there is an expression where they say, okay, it means I am the God who will exact punishment and I am the God who will give reward. And why is this taught within the mitzvah of tzitzit? Because even a minor mitzvah like tzitzis has its concepts of rewards and punishment and you don't know what it is and I don't know what it is in the world to come, but I can give you an example. What's my mitzvah? What's my reward for tzitzit? I've been wearing, I'm wearing a talit. I wear a talit every morning. So where's my reward? No. And so the Talmud says, you never know when that reward's going to come. It might come as you're climbing up and you've reached that golden ladder at the top of the sixth, sixth, sixth mattress where you least expect it. That's where your reward for wearing, for doing a mitzvah might, uh, it might be lurking. It might be lurking in the most unexpected places. So keep doing the mitzvahs because you never know when it's going to slap you in the face and save you from, from, uh, from, from, from sin. Okay. Thank you, uh, thank you all, and we're going to end end with that. This we could dedicate many, many different classes and sessions to that one story, and 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 we will. We'll come back to it. I imagine for many of us, it's the first time seeing that story. The Talmud is filled with stories that would would shock you and me if we actually sat down and looked at them and explored them. And that's part of the the excitement of tradition is that we Rabbi, don't shy away from these, kinds, from these kinds of uh of you're topics. terrific does, thank you where, where does the concept come in like we have in halakha mazid and shoge if you have the intention that is is relevant and this is kind of pushed off to the side in this story this man is not acting the way he should and there is no taking him to task for it at all yeah, look, yeah, there, there, there's he's wearing, another he's, class uh, that we could explore. He's, he's, yeah. Another class that we could explore has to do with the concept of intent and yeah. goodwill. And this is not just a Jewish question. This is a secular philosophical question as to what defines what defines good, what defines a good act. Is it connected to good intent or is it good results or a combination of the two? And you will find, or is it something different, uh, completely different, like a utilitarian approach, which will only define something good if it's if it's exponentially increased will increase the good of that uh, of that act there's a lot to explore there um but uh for, for another time but in the meantime i wish everybody a shabbat shalom wonderful shabbat shabbat shalom. Shalom. And, uh, next week will be our final week before a little bit of a break for the summer i thought it was this one. Oh, no, no. Good. We get a bonus a bonus week next week oh Great. wonderful okay okay all right okay make sure everyone. i get a reminder Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi.